Good morning. Okay, so today is lecture two on the new family systems model that I'm developing. Let me um, share the screen. So get a pen and paper so you can figure out your family number. Okay, can you see that? My video goes away when I share <laughs> share the screen. So just let me know you can. So I titled this, Your Family is Greek Gods on Mount Olympus, How Your Family Creates Its Kingdom and How to Dethrone It. And so this is a piggyback from Tuesday's lecture about dethroning your parents, which in essence is what you have to do. Just to reiterate, your parents live in your mind. It's the subconscious mind that you come to dethrone based on value system, family structure, beliefs, ideals, everything that they gave you at the moment of conception. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about opportunities that show up in your life and how they show up so that you can dethrone your parents. The idea is that you should supersede, at least meet or supersede your parents. And then I'm also gonna to talk to you about castration because all parents castrate their child in some way. I'll link it to astrology with Jupiter as what you wanna dethrone and Saturn what castrates you. So a lot of people and a lot of you guys, and we're starting the astrology next week, so you're gonna hear more and more about this, but want to know more about the mythology. So I put a slide here about the 12 Olympian gods. In my next slide, I'm going to explain a little bit. But if you have an idea of the 12 gods, you're going to have an idea of how you show up in your family and your clients in their family. So Zeus or Jupiter, Hera or Juno, they were married. Poseidon or Neptune, he was a brother of Zeus, rules the oceans. Hades or Pluto rules the underworld. Hestia or Vesta, she represents the home, like the fireplace, cooking. Athena or Minerva, she's the god of war, but of strategy and wisdom. Artemis or Diana, which I talked a little bit about on Tuesday, um, she was like the Amazonian. Um, she's in charge of the hunt. Apollo is the sun. Um, he is Artemis's twin brother that she helped birth. Aphrodite was a product of the castration, very important, and why everybody is castrated by their parents. She's the product of a castration of Uranus. She's the goddess of love and beauty. And again, it's first self-love and then agape love in the fourth chakra. Hephaestus was the only god that was thrown out of Olympus because he was deformed, son of Zeus and Hera. Ares, also son of Zeus and Hera, god of war, but not strategy like Athena, but brute conflict. We talked about that in interpersonal conflict when I showed you the, the model of marriage and children. And then Hermes or Mercury, who is like the trickster, the messenger, the communicator god. And children will show up like this in the family. And I want you today to try to identify which one you show up as or which one your parents would say you show up as because the one that you show up as has to do a lot with your role in the family and then of course how you're going to dethrone your parents and i'm going to go through that in a minute so i just kind of broke down by parents and children uranus i told you was castrated and as a result aphrodite was born Cronus and Rhea were titans. Cronus is also known as Saturn. You'll hear me say Saturn more than Cronus. And they had four children, Zeus, Neptune, Hestia, and Hera. Cronus, again, Saturn, and Ops had Hades. So even though the world was divided by Zeus, upper world, or the heavens, um, Neptune or Poseidon got the oceans, the middle world. Hades got the lower world. Hades was also a child of of um, Kronos or Saturn, but he had a different mother. Zeus and Hera, I told you, had Hephaestus and Ares and was last class when I built the model on relationships. Zeus birthed Athena by himself. 
through his head. Zeus and Leto was a mortal, had Artemis and Apollo, which were the twin brother and sister. And then Zeus and Maya, and that's a very important word, had Hermes. Maya is a word that means illusion or delusion. And Hermes is this idea that we know ourselves. Um, Hermes is the trickster god, and he's the one that kinds of kind of trick. You'll see in, in a moment that people who have this usually have a relationship with their parents as friends rather than parent and child. And I'll go into that. So I'm going to talk about how we show up as these gods in, in archetypes in our family. But I'm going to use a mystical symbol called the Enneagram. Now, in your psychological studies, not necessarily with me, but when you read about personality, and we did cover personality in the personality theories class, you're going to come across this tool. This tool is called the Enneagram. It has been, like many things, mystical, watered down, and now is used for personality traits, like the peacekeeper um, or the truth teller. I'm not teaching you that. That you can go online, you can do the little, you know, test on the internet and find out if you're the peacekeeper and whatnot. I want to teach you the mystical roots and how this impacts your life, your place in the family, the archetype or the myth that you live out, how your parents need to be dethroned based on your number and how to find out your family number. So this is the new theory. OK, so this is um, I took this information and I created my theory on it um, and I'm going to go through that today. So first of all, this is a mystical tool. It starts with a circle. I told you that circle is the first step of sacred geometry. It's what starts everything. It's wholeness itself. It's the universe. It's the earth. It's the four directions. It's alchemy. It's everything. The circle. And I mentioned my Pi Day post for my birthday. Um, because the circle important. Now, this is split up into nine points, you can see. What this means, and I'll talk about this a little later, is that growth in life is spiral. This goes to a spiral, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And everything can be broken down from one to nine. So this is like basic numerology that we've covered before. And if you want to know a little bit more about your numerology, Personally, that I'll do on the side, but I'm using numerology concepts, but in a different way today. So Gurdjieff, who I've talked to you about before, is a famous philosopher, a meaning philosopher of mine that I love. And he is the one who kind of popularized this tool mystically. He kind of resurfaced it. It is believed to come from Sufism. Sufism is the mystical tradition of Islamic tradition, of Islamic religion. He writes very little about it. Um, so I've done sort of my own interpretation based on all the mysticism that I know and developed this theory today. But I hold his teaching sacred um, and we're going to use this tool. And it's really going to help you understand your family, your own life, if you start a business, if you start a relationship. Every single thing you start, the origin story, that creation myth, will go through these nine steps inevitably. This is law. So I'm going to teach that to you and then extrapolate that out to the family structure and why families don't work. This is considered sacred geometry. Everything is reduced from one to nine. Pythagoras, the mathematician, um, realized this, and that's where we get the concepts of numerology. And Gurdjieff called this the law of ninefoldness. I've talked to you before about the law of octaves and how everything in my model, my first model, is based on the law of octaves. This is an extension of that. It's pretty much the same thing. So there's a ninefold path that speaks starting from the origin story at one. Every single point has a meaning. And wherever you birth something, whether it's a child, a business, a romance, a bank account, it will go through these points. And I, I've identified that there's points of crisis, neutralization, which I spoke briefly about today. I'm going to develop my theory of neutralization a little further, and endings. And so every single relationship or partnership or 
or business venture goes through these nine points. However, like I said on Tuesday, if you're together with someone 50 years, you're just going to go through these nine points over and over and over and over again. And that is how you're going to create change and growth. But you're still going to see the same pattern reemerge from the origin story, from the point of conception. That's why you are just the one thread, whether it's the chakra, whether it's your astrology chart, it doesn't matter. You are that one issue that in this lifetime you come to work through over and over and over and over again. And this is just another way of saying that, but showing the clear point where you're going to have a crisis, where a child might represent a crisis, where there's an opportunity for change. Okay, so what are the nine numbers? These are some general words, so you have an idea. And I'm going to develop this more fully. I'm probably in the book going to have like worksheets so that you could give to the parents and the children and they can kind of circle the keywords. So I've just started developing this. The number one is the origin, the origin story, the creation myth, its beginnings and its conception. Number two has to do with harmony and relationships. The number three has to do with the first shock. So it might be a shock of finding out you're pregnant. It might be a first change in the relationship. Um, it could be the thought, today I want to start a business, and you're thinking about putting it into action. You haven't put it into action yet. So there are ideas. The number four has to do with crisis, responsibility, limitation, and something that's materialized. This is going to later on be our neutralizer and I'll get to that. And these words are important because when I teach you how to calculate your family number, you're gonna go back to this. The number five has to do with change, fun, staying childlike. The number six has to do with work, efficiency. It's also a stabilizer in the system. The number seven has to do with inner processes, spiritual crisis, going inward or finding your inner resources. The number eight has to do with power, money, and finding yourself, your capital S self. And the number nine has to do with endings that then relates to new beginnings. So the, I, in my next slide, I have additional words. So what I did was I started the theory and I started reaching out to people and doing the theory, getting you know my hypothesis in action. Um, and I've started confirming that these are indeed the words. Now, these are not original. In numerology, if you go to a numerology book or a website, you're going to find similarity. So this isn't new in terms of numerology. What's new is the fact that I'm bringing it to the family structure and to your, your number in your family. It may seem like it's related to birth order. It isn't, but it does have some overlap. Obviously, there's no new story. So plotting your family kingdom Oh, that's the same one. Sorry. Okay. What is the symbolic meanings of your family number? If you are a number one, you are what we call the monad, unity, you're the basis of creation. If you are a number two, and I'll teach you how to calculate your family number in a minute, you're going to bring opposites, you're going to bring conflict, you're going to bring interaction or the possibility of interaction. I mentioned before harmony and relationships. That's also the truth. This is more of the shadow of what I stated in the previous slide. Number three, children can resolve conflicts and they're maybe in charge of reconciliation. Maybe they were a child that was born to fix the relationship. The number four has to do with the construction of the world. It's funny that my mother used this word. I'm a four in my family. And my mother said, oh, we were constructing the new house. So I was actually part and parcel of moving from New York to Florida because they were constructing a new house. So, again, something that's happening energetically in the child that they take into the psyche as part of their, their origin story or their myth. Number five is growth but retains its shape. So these are people that will grow, 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 but their essence remains the same. Number six has to do with symmetry, order, being organized. These are maybe the children that are like keeping the parents in order. We got to go. Soccer starts at seven, things like that. 
Number seven is a prime number and it doesn't produce. This does not mean that these children, seven children, don't have children. That could be one reason uh, that they're the seven number, but it's more of an inward, it's more of a solitary number. It's maybe somebody who's dedicated themselves to themselves, their spiritual life, an inward journey. Um, the number eight is the symmetry of four. So four plus four is eight. So if you go to eight, if you go to four, it talks about the construction of the world or the construction of something. This is a higher vibration. Eight people will work and they'll get results. That's why it's linked to power and money. And number nine, and you'll see in a moment when I do the spiral, is the same origin story. So what you based your family on, what you based your business on, what you based your relationship on, but it's a healthier, newer version or new vibration of the origin story. So I'm going to teach you how to get your family number so that you can do this. So the rules to this system, again, everything is a system, just like when I taught you the relationship model, and there's only 100% in a system. You cannot have more, you cannot have less. So if there's 16 people in the family, then one sixteenth everybody gets. If there's three people, then one third everybody gets. So how you distribute it, and that's what we're gonna see is the, the maldistribution of the parents with the kids. That's why there's black sheep like Hephaestos. That's why they're preferred children like Athena. And you're gonna see how you live that out or how your client lives that out in their family structure. But everything is a system and there's only 100%. Our goal as therapists is to help the family make it an equal system so everybody has an appropriate piece of the pie. You have to find out who is the king and queen of the system. In a moment, I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to show you a little model where I put king, queen, and then the three prince and princesses. Well, that's an ideal structure. That's not necessarily how it is. Sometimes the kids are the king and queen. Sometimes the father and the daughter, because the mother's an alcoholic or depressed, the, the mother's the princess and the oldest daughter's the queen. This has to be rearranged so that we have a healthy system. But even if it's not, it's fine. We can still understand why there are problems in the system, knowing who the king and queen of the system are, and of course the prince and princesses if there's children. This could also be extrapolated to simply the, the relationship, like the Heros Gamos, and the mystical marriage of the partners, um, but this particular model has to do with children. The children are unintegrated shadow aspects of the parents. This is super, super, super important. Parents do not like parts of their children. They may love their children, but they don't necessarily like their children. And those aspects that they don't like are the shadow aspects that they never incorporated. And now the children come like a big thorn in their face to show them get to work. So like I always say, parents do your work so your kids don't have to. And the kids can do the work that their soul came to do. This was interesting because every parent that I asked when collecting data for the, for the model had trouble saying what they didn't like about the kid. Just say something, you know there's something, but they were like embarrassed or shy or, and then when they finally said it, it made sense to me. My mother said that I was like a little uh, hoarder and I'm not a hoarder, I was when I was a little girl, but my mother is like hoarder of all hoarders and that was the thing she didn't like about me as a child and I thought that to be really funny. So parents are gonna say these things and haven't realized that it's about themselves that they're speaking. And you guys know this since I drill that into you. You're gonna calculate the numerology of the child or the children, I'll teach you that in a moment. You're gonna ask the parents in their own words, what was the child like from birth to one year? The reason I use birth to one year is because that's the origin story. Obviously, in my previous models, and if the parents remember and want to share, that's great, too. You can ask about the conception. You can ask about the pregnancy. You can ask about the birth. That's going to give you some extra information. But for this particular model, what was the child like birth to a year? Because that's the birth. That's the conception origin story that that child is then going to live out. 
what didn't you like about the child? Okay, and I said child of then, not the child of now. Yesterday, I phrased it in a few ways. When they were little, and then I said up until seven, I gave different variations to see what I got. It's the same stuff. If the parent is stuck, just ask them from zero to seven, what didn't you like about them? Because I'm going to explain seven as that first sort of crisis and opportunity to um, the neutralizer in the system. So ask them about the child, not now, okay? Why is this question so important? If we go back to the seven gates, the child is stuck with the mind that the parents had a conception. Not now that your parents have had, you know, 40 years to improve themselves. Of course, something's going to change about when you were a child, the moment of conception of the child, that first year of life, okay? Things that still bother the parents about you is because those parents have still not integrated that subconscious trauma from their childhood. If not, your whole family system would have changed, which is what happened to me upon getting cancer. When I realized all of this, I shift the system, therefore the whole family structure changed. Everyone assumed their rightful place. Prior to that, I was still living from my subconscious trauma, from my wounds, and therefore my children were responding back to me with my traumas. These are some hypotheses. There's usually a mediator child. There's usually a tyrant child. There's usually a mother archetype or a mother child. And there's usually an identified patient. Obviously, if there's one child, it's going to be different than if there's four children. And I'll go a little deeper into this, linking it back to the archetypes of the Greek gods in a few slides. But these are sort of some hypotheses that I have. So if you identify with this, for instance, I was the identified patient or the black sheep, and I was also the mediator, and I was also the mother. So sometimes one child will assume various roles. So depending on how many children are in the system and who assumes what part of the system. So suggested family dynamics. What I did was I broke down the Olympian gods and their children, and I've kind of made some hypotheses about how this would show up in the family structure with uh, a couple. So the traditional Zeus and Hera, they have a Hephaestus and an Aries. One of the child children might be the tyrant. One child might be the innocent or the weakling. It tends to be what I see at practice, more normal people that say their snow globe is intact. They had a really happy, normal, balanced childhood. This is sort of how it works. Not to say that everyone only has two children, but that quintessential fa family, mother, father, son, daughter, this seems to be the model that they portray. Normal kingdom, children don't dethrone their parents. That's part of our job is to help them shatter that snow globe, realize there is a place to dethrone their parents, and of course, balance out the siblings. We don't want one tyrant and one weakling. We want them to be equals. Zeus. Zeus had a daughter, Athena. This tends to be the father-daughter duo. Um, it could be by virtue of the mother being widowed or the mother's an alcoholic and the daughter had to step up. There is a clear relationship that this is daddy's girl. This girl is loves her father. The wrong alliance is with the father. The mother has, is the mistress. The mother that's been kicked out of the system needs to be integrated. This is oftentimes very hard because um, the woman in this particular uh, relationship with the father may not find a suitable marriage partner because she has all expectations to match up to her father. And it's very difficult to dethrone the father so that another man can match up to him. So that's some of the problems I see in practice with this sort of dynamic. Zeus and Leto had Artemis and Apollo. Oftentimes there's twins. Okay, this could be a twin relationship. Not, all, not always, but it could be. Um, oftentimes if it's a fraternal twin, one of the twins boy, one of the twin girl, the girl and the boys can be very athletic. Um, the daughter might be very pure, virginal. Um, she might be very athletic. Oftentimes the wrong alliance is with the mother. 
Um, she becomes the mother's mother. Um, she helped birth her brother. There might be some sibling rivalry. She might think she has to take care of her brother. She's responsible for the brother. Um, or the brother in the relationship has more power. Maybe there's a pure, a pure hierarchical sort of males in the family are more um, flagrant in terms of power than um, the daughters. So the typical male power in the family, that could be. Um, but the, the daughter tends to mother the mother, be the mother of the mother, nurture the mother. Um, and these are themes that you'll see. Now, this goes in alignment with the lecture that I gave you a couple weeks ago on unmet needs and the chakras and the fairy tales. So all of this, again, is building on this model. And then Zeus and Maya had Hermes. Um, Hermes is the trickster, the clowns. These are the people that are like really funny in the family. They're always making jokes. They stand out um, because they're the comedians. They also tend to be liars. Not necessarily that they're blatant liars that they want to lie, but they maybe lie to themselves. They don't know themselves. They don't know how to look inside. These people tend to have their parents and children are like friends or brothers and sisters more than parents and children. So these people don't know how to parent themselves and they stay the eternal child. They're, they're like an innocent, but a, li a little different. They don't like to grow up. So kind of Peter Pan-like um, when they have this, this relationship with their parents. So this is gonna, of course, be linked to the wrong alliance at the base of the triangle from the previous theory and the parent that's missing would be the mistress or the one we're going to incorporate. So these are just some archetypes, and you can see if you can relate to yourself. The Aphrodite child. Now, what I'm thinking, and again, I still haven't fully developed this, is to make like a handout and give this to all of the members of the family or give this to the parents and say which one represents your daughter or your son, and then let the parents identify. This will be something that they don't necessarily like about their child or something that they really like about their child. So if you have an Aphrodite child or you're the Aphrodite, you may tend to castrate men, your father or male partners. So maybe they hop from one guy to the next to the next breaking hearts. This could be the heartbreaker archetype. Hephaestos, black sheep, it could be someone who's adopted. It can be a child that feels problematic. The child themselves feels like the outsider of the family or spends time at another house. So I was very much a Hephaestos. I told you my mother like gave me over to the cult leader. I was the black sheep. I didn't fit in even in my body size. Everyone was really thin. I was loud. Everyone was quiet. And I lived pr primarily at the neighbor's house. Aries is the warrior. They might be drawn to the military. They might be conflicted. They might be the yeller of the family. They might try to resolve conflict by yelling, not in a peacemaker, peacemaker way, but more like yelling. There was a story that I heard in my family from my first husband's uncle, who he was like the Aries warrior archetype. And one day he took the table and he threw the table at dinner and said, enough, this family needs to change. So it's that type of person. This person might be a bodybuilder. They might have interest in sports. Athena is daddy's girl. She's the strategist. She's the one maybe who's organizing the family trips. We're going to go here first. We're going to go here next. They also tend to be overachievers. Artemis is the mama's girl. So she might be the nurturer. She might take care of mom when she's sick. She might help mom cook in the kitchen. Apollo tends to be the athlete. They tend to be the golden child, top of the class, overachiever. Hermes is the class clown. They lie. They're funny. They might steal. They might skip class. Zeus. The Zeus is the good luck chuck. Sunshine follows them wherever they go. They're the traveler. They're the free spirit. They're really smart, usually. Neptune tends to be depressed, emotional, sensitive, spiritual, and a recluse. Pluto, they have dark sense of humor. They're attracted to dark people, maybe. The shadows, they like to sit in their room for long periods of time in the dark and not really interact with other people in the family. Hera is all about following the rules. She's strict. She's fixed. 
She has to do it right. So like if the, the parent says, oh, don't worry. No, you taught me that I had to pick up every toy before I can have dessert. And the parent's like, it's okay, have dessert. No, 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 that's the hair of kid. And then Hestia is very nurturing. She likes to cook. She's loving. She cleans. She takes care of the animals in the house. So similar to Artemis, but um, more domestic, whereas Artemis is more about the mom, taking care of the mom's needs. So think of which one you are in your family. You could be a couple, but you're going to have one primary theme. So how do you calculate your family number? First, discover what year your parents got married. Okay, if they never got legally married, I'm using it as legally married. If they never got married, then find out when they got together. Okay, so for instance, my parents got married in 1961. 1961 is going to be year one. Then you're going to take what year you were born. I was born in 1973. And now I'm going to subtract 1961 from 1973. And then that number you're going to reduce to one to nine. And I'm a four. So I want you to understand this. Is everyone able to do this? Get your paper and calculate. If you don't know what year your parents got married or got together, find out, and then you can, you can calculate. This is an extrapolation of numerology. This is not one to nine numerology. One to nine numerology is your date of birth, your year of birth, and um, you bring that to the simplest. That's your life path number. There's numbers of the day that you were born. We're not doing that. This is specific to my model where I'm using the energy of the Enneagram that I'm now going to describe, but you need to know what number you are in the family so you know what archetype, you know what God you're living in your family and how to dethrone your parents. So please make sure you understand this. So for instance, I was the number four. This number is the shadow in the um, it's the construction, it's the crisis, it's the number that's, um, that's uh, what I, I'm calling the negotiator, um, and that's going to be my role, that's how I'm going to show up. Okay, so find out your number, and I gave you earlier the two slides of the numbers one to nine, that's going to dictate what role you play in your family. So ask parents the feelings. What good qualities did the child have from birth to a year? Did they walk quickly? Did they sleep well? Um, were they easy? Was it an easy birth? This is gonna give you the light aspects or the good bucket items. The parents don't have an issue with that and you don't have an issue with that aspect of your life because your parents didn't say, hey, this bothers me. However, this was what I found that the parents had difficulty with, what negative qualities or difficulties does the, the child have? I asked different parents different things. I decided that I was going to ask the first seven years. So within the first seven, the zero to seven, what negative qualities did the child have or what difficulties did you encounter? Okay, so some said they're picky eaters. Some said that they were just difficult. I had an adoptive parent who said the boy was difficult to integrate into the family, make him part of the system. So this is going to follow the child through over and over and over again. This is simply the parent talking about the child. This was already established at the moment of conception in the child's psyche. This is just like in the first book, what don't you like about your parents, bad buckets? This is now the parent saying what they don't like about the child, sort of populating the child bat buckets, but it all goes back to the parents. If the parents do their work, the kids don't have to do it for them. But now this model is about hearing it from the parents so that the parents can understand that their children are not broken. Their children are not problematic. Their children are simply shadow aspects of what the parents never did. And it's time to get to work. Okay. I noticed that the parents had difficulty with this, so I changed it to the first seven years, and that might give it a little easier time. Your number. Your number tells what your parents need to integrate in themselves. So if they get a number one, they need to put themselves first, maybe. 
They get a number two, maybe they have to stop being so conflictive and be more harmonious. They get a number, number three, maybe they have to be more creative. I already have two slides earlier that I went through those. This tells you the need you came to fulfill in them. Okay, so I'm just going to make it very simple with my example. My mother said that she didn't like that I was like a little hoarder and that I would keep a bunch of things. And my mother is the hoarder. So I came, A, with the need to fulfill as a shadow to show her what she needs to integrate in herself. And then bigger than that, I was a number four that she was the conflict. Therefore, my black sheep, my part of being conflictive was mirroring to her, perhaps her conflictive nature. Tells the mind they gave you a conception. Your number tells me as a therapist what mind they gave the child. Now the child is gonna live this out into the zero to 100, which we'll talk about in a moment. And it means that if your parents are still bothered by you in this respect, they still have not integrated it yet. Most parents, unfortunately, don't. Parents may change in their 60s and their 70s, and I'm going to show you the whole spiral um, timeline of when you can change, because you can't always change. There are marked times in life where you're given opportunities to change. If the parent doesn't take advantage, they can die pretty much like they were born. And unfortunately, we see this. And in, in alcoholism, they call us a dry drunk. The person stops drinking, but they don't work the model. They don't work the steps of AA. They haven't really changed. So that's obviously a waste of a lifetime. I'm a believer that everyone changes something, that as you spiral up, you learn small things maybe, maybe not huge leaps, but something is something. Okay, what do the parents' feelings say? When the parent says what I like or what I don't like, what they're saying is the good qualities confirm the good bucket items, what you got from them. Great. My sister walked early. So my mother liked the fact that she was ahead of her time, that she was early. She was an overachiever. My sister is indeed a four, an overachiever. She's very much the Hera archetype. So you see parallels between the archetype or the god, goddess quality, you see, um, then we'll see what she has to dethrone, and um, you see the good bucket items. The negative qualities that the parents say is the unmet need we passed on to our kids and continue unless we reshuffle the kingdom, own our self with a capital S, dethrone our parents, and dethrone the shadow aspects or integrate the shadow aspects of the parent, and this all confirms the number that we come through. So I'm a number four. So I have to construct. I have to build. It means the material world. You all know my story about me not wanting to be in the material world, only the spirit world. So there's many ways this can play out. And of course, in your dialogue with the family, you're going to get the story and the myth that they're living out in the family. But the number and the feelings that the parents say and the number that you are based on your family will dictate the positive qualities or the good buckets. And then of course the negative qualities are the unmet needs that you think you need to do for your parent, but really they need to do for themselves. You'll have to dethrone them so you can live your own life. So here I have rearranged the kingdom. On Tuesday, I talked about the king and the queen and I use the British monarchy, and then the children. Some hypothesis. There's going to be a weakling or an innocent. There's going to be something castrated. If the parents are not dethroned or the parents don't move out of the way and allow the kids to dethrone them as is supposed to be, the kids and the parents are going to suffer. So I have a wonderful family that I counsel. The, they are the epitome of Zeus and Hera. They are the king and the queen of their throne. They have two grown adult male children who have been unable to have children. Not because they're not virile, but because they don't have permission from the parents to dethrone them to be the father. So the father is holding the place of king 
I'm the king, you guys are my princes, and until I die, perhaps, maybe by then it'll be too late, or they won't want children, or they'll never dethrone the parents because they'll idealize them, these children will now be castrated in their parenting. So there's different ways we castrate our children. We castrate them financially, we castrate them sexually, we castrate them in developing their own family. This is the healthy representation of the family. Please do not misinterpret that there has to be a male, a female, two boys, and a girl. That is not what I'm saying. I'm using these symbols to explain a, a king and a queen in whatever that is, if it's homosexual, heterosexual, it doesn't matter. And I'm going to go a little deeper in a minute. You can have one children, no children. That's the Heroes Gamos book. We're talking about families with at least one child, adopted, doesn't matter, fits the model. Two, and I use three because I have three kids, okay? So, and I happen to have two boys and a girl, so that's the only reason I use this model. But I want to get to first the king and the queen. The king and the queen, however that is, has to be the parents and the adults. The children cannot be the king and the queen. Either that the children have the hierarchy and the parents are down here, which sometimes happens, especially in this generation that we're living. The kids are calling the shots and, and the famous, you know, uh, Macaulay Culkins of the world suing their parents. I mean, ridiculousness. Obviously, that family structure, Britney Spears we're seeing now with the fault. I mean, that's nonsense. Parents have to be parents and children have to be children. And money, of course, and fame is something that destabilizes the kingdom. So everybody has to put in their rightful place. But most of us are not Macaulay Culkin and Britney Spears. But many people will marry their father. The mother's depressed. The mother's a drunk. The mother's dead. And what happens? The daughter assumes the role of the queen. Wrong. That is a not proper kingdom. What happens is the girl's space down here is no longer filled. She will not live out her life. She is living a phantom life of a queen, of a mother, of a wife that belongs to someone else. She won't be able to get her own partner. So think of Zeus and Athena. I had a client who had this case, talked in class about her father, her father, her father, loves her father, her father dies, idolized her father. She could not for the life of her keep a man because he was always living in the shadow of the father. Therefore, she castrated the men in her life because no one measured up. It's fine to be a daddy's girl and love your father and everybody has a wrong alliance, but you cannot already be taken as someone else's queen because then your space energetically fails to be fulfilled. Same goes with a father and a son, a father and a daughter, a father, uh, the, the mother and the daughter. So, for instance, my mother was the queen. And I was in the shadows. I was her, her shadow aspect, but let's just say I was, um, I was the king to her queen. Therefore, I castrated myself. My space down here was empty, and then I couldn't live out my life. And that would be an Artemis um, Apollo uh, mythology. Is this clear? Now, I put here zero to 100 in neutralizer, and I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth about the neutralizer in a minute. I mentioned that to you on Tuesday to let you know that in our life, law of pendulum, we swing from zero to 100, zero to 100. But the universe, call it a helper, call it a teacher, call it a child, call it God, call it uh, an opportunity, call it sickness, I don't care will come and give you what's called a neutralizer, something to slow down these huge pendulum swings. Because the natural energy flows from zero to 100, zero to 100, zero to 100. If we don't have a neutralizer, we will never be able to see and identify what we need to change. And I told you I was gonna bring the pendulum this week to show you in the video, but I'll bring it Tuesday because I forgot. But basically the pendulum in psychic work goes zero to 100 and the 48 to 52 balances and that's the answer you get from the spirit guides. It's the same concept. So I put here three children as an example. 
You're going to have one child, as an example, zero, very, very quiet. A hundred, very, very talkative. And then a neutralizer child who maybe is at midpoint. Talks a little, doesn't talk that much. Okay, you can extrapolate this to your own family. It can be someone who lies a lot. It can be someone who, who never lies. And then that one kid that knows how to mediate. This is probably where family roles and birth order concepts come from. Uh, I do believe a bit in that. And knowing metaphysical law, a lot of that makes sense. But if you want to add that to this, you can. But a lot of that probably comes from these sort of mystical metaphysical laws in terms of birth order. But that's not what we're doing. OK, so it doesn't have to necessarily be the oldest child is the perfectionist. The last child is the baby that does everything wrong. And the middle child is someone in the middle. It doesn't have to fall into birth order, but there might be some truth because of of the law of the pendulum. But there tends to be um, a child that is one extreme when the other when there's two children. The bad thing about only having one kid is that one kid is going to be burdened with the needs of both parents and have to carry the load. So if it's only this child, because there's not three, that child might have to dethrone their parents in various places because the parents might have several unmet needs. When you split the dynamic, like in my case, three, my three children can quote unquote equally, if we're doing it right, hopefully, equally split mine and their father's buckets. And that's a little bit less of a burden on the child. But that's to be determined. Okay, some things about dethroning your parents. First of all, children, children, I am calling children zero to 18 okay so i'm using regular language societally children need parents not friends okay you can talk to your parents you can be friendly but your parents need to parent you not be your friends around the teen years and you're going to see in a moment around 14 to 16 years the child should start questioning the family values maybe about money, about sex, about gender roles, about social justice, whatever it is. That is appropriate. I'm not going to speak about developmental psychology, but you can go to Erickson, you can go to Piaget. We've spoken about this in traditional theory, and they get this from metaphysical and spiritual law, whether they know it or not. So around 14 to 16, your children should start questioning your values. This is when I mostly get calls from parents. Oh, my God, my kid's acting out. Oh, my kid's suicidal. Oh, my kid wants this. Oh, my kid is so bad. Oh, he joined a gang. Some things are horrible, obviously, gang and, and suicide versus other things that they're smoking pot. But there is a crisis in the system, and I'll show you in the law of the pendulum why. This is exactly when children should start questioning the values. So I found this great game called the One Thing Core Values. So I'm going to incorporate this into the model. I just got it, so I have to play with it. But you can play a values game, or you can give your client, the child and the parents, a sheet of the values and see what values they still have and what values they've yet to sort of establish on their own. Your children should not have all of your same values. They should break away. This is part of the rape of Persephone. This is part of the leaving home of the prodigal son. Okay, this is mythology in a nutshell. By 18, children should start to dethrone their parents. Parents, let them. Parents do not let their children dethrone them. Like I said, bitch, move out the way. Let the kids dethrone you. You're going to see in a moment other opportunities that the child gets to dethrone the parents. At 18 is when they should. Astrologically at 18, we have something called the nodes. The future nodes are open. This happens every 18 years. 
and we do get that opportunity. But at 18, your child should quote unquote leave home. This does not mean that every child has to leave home. I was not allowed to leave home. But you have to leave home from your psyche. You've got to dethrone your parents in your thoughts. That's when Hercules tames the man-eating mares. Start identifying what are your thoughts and what are your parents' thoughts? What are your values and your parents' values? That's where the game is a really good idea. And this game is specifically about identifying what values of your parents you keep, the Costco card, and which ones you dethrone, your Nordstrom's. I hope you can see how all of the theories are coming together. If parents don't let the children dethrone them, the children will be infantilized. They're not going to grow into their full potential. They're going to stay small and they're going to be castrated. This may relate in them finding a woman or a man that's exactly like the castrating parent, a woman that bitches all day or a man that hits them. That's at the zero to a hundred or some version thereof. Doing the opposite of your parents is not dethroning the parents. The the dethroning is the 48 to 52. I'll get to that in a minute. Doing the opposite is not. It's hashtag do it different. Take the good of your parents, the things you like. Dethrone the things they don't. If you want to see where to dethrone your parents, go to Jupiter in your chart. That'll tell you where you have an opportunity to dethrone your parents. I shared with you financially my chart with my dad specifically, and Saturn is where your parents castrate you. All parents castrate their children somewhere. In mine, it was the seventh house of relationships. So that's going to be my thread when I show you the spiral that I'm gonna keep working on zero to 100, zero to 100, until I finally, the neutralizer in the system shows me how to get the 48 to 52. The law of the pendulum, and I have that poster in the classroom. It's a little different. This one I got off the internet. Just say zero to 100. It says left, negative, right, positive. Forget the right, left, negative, positive. It's the idea that there's three steps. There's the zero, there's the 100, and the zero position is healthy when it's the 48 to 52. That might take you a lifetime. That might take you forever. That might take you 10 jobs, 13 relationships, 14 divorces. I don't know. Each person is different. It might take one marriage of 50 years, all 50 years, to reach the 48 to 52. This is not easy, 0, 100, 48 to 52. That's not what it works. So what I told you on Tuesday is that you have neutralizers. Neutralizers are points in the system, and I'm going to explain it a little bit more today, it could be teachers, could be therapists, could be TV shows, could be aha moments that come in to show you something different. This does not mean that just because you notice it and think it, that you do it. It could be a thought and it can stay in the thought. Does not mean that you are neutral, that you are going to a 48 to 52 just because you realize like me, I needed to integrate my feminine I had a feminine birth of Venus party, but it wasn't until three bouts of cancer later that I finally integrated my mother. Then I stopped getting cancer. So it takes some time to go zero to 100, zero to 100, zero to 100 in a family or in a person's life before they achieve the 48 to 52 in the balance. I'll go deeper into that now. You will go zero to 100. This is the law of the pendulum. It's a metaphysical law. All of my systems, all of my theories are rooted in universal law. They don't change even if you're ignorant of them. I just extrapolate it to psychology. You will have something that I'm calling a neutralizer midway. I'll get a little bit more into that in a moment. In each direction. So as you're going to zero, as you're going to 100, about seven years old, and I'll go into that more, you're going to get a neutralizer. Then you're going to go to the 100, which is at 14 years. Then at 21, you're going to go back, you're going to have a neutralizer. At 28, you're going to go back to zero, full circle. 
and so forth. 7, 14, 21, 38, 35, like that. And I'll show you on the next slide. For parents, the zero is the origin story, the bad buckets, the good buckets, the myth that they come to live out. So if you're, if you're talking to parents, and if obviously if you're talking to an individual client, you're going to use the seven gates, same idea, creation, myth, origin, story. The zero is that. At seven years old, from zero to seven, right, you know that the child has now developed their personality, they've gotten their story, they've gotten their crisis, and it's their first skinny cow. That skinny cow, that first crisis is considered a neutralizer. If parents remember what the problem was with their child between zero to seven, that is going to be a neutralizer to help the parent redirect the whole kingdom and say, oh shit, my kid got an illness or my kid hit someone on the playground. And they can now redirect the energy so that when they get to 14, they don't have a full blown out crisis. Most parents don't do that. It's part of the story of the kid. And at 14, we're having the point of tension. The kid joins the gang. The kid gets killed in school. The kid is doing drugs. But you got a notification midway. You got a neutralizer. The principal, the, the teacher, your parents' friends. Someone intervened. Some neutralizer showed up to let you, the parents, know your kid was in the wrong direction. And you ignored it, as we do. Instead, we make the kid a problem. Oh my God, they're acting out. Look at this. It's a neutralizer. It's an aha. It's an indicator of what is coming when that pendulum goes all the way to 100. And that starts at 14 that I told you earlier is when the kid should start trying to dethrone the parents, questioning the values. This is how a kid leaves home properly, doesn't get castrated, assumes his own throne. We're not doing this in our family. At 14, the children are trying to dethrone the parents, but it's too early, okay? In Judaism, the Jews have a bar mitzvah for their son, and they're supposed to take on Judaism and choose to have their religion and be an adult symbolically and spiritually and because this law occurs at that age that's why they're doing that but it's still too early at 14 we are not developed our prefrontal cortex we've not developed sufficiently we do not have lived experience to know what our values are at 18 we should start at 18 we're considered in this country at least to be adults we should start to dethrone the parents and by 28 this process should be done. Most of us are not there at 28, but ideally it should be done. Parents need to move out of the way, yield the throne to the child. So now the kingdom has been rearranged. Now those children can get on the throne and the parents can be underneath the, the throne. They're going to have their own sort of throne, hopefully their own marriage and their own life, and the kids should hopefully be starting their own family, and that's how we dethrone them. But if they're all in the same home, this is when it's appropriate that the kids assume the throne and the parents move out of the way. If parents die without being dethroned mentally, this may cause a problem because child may idealize the parents and never individuate. Okay, we need to have the individuation process leave home and, and, and become our own king and queen of our own kingdom. Sometimes when parents, especially if they were good parents, they die, we idealize them, and then we never dethrone them. It's actually easier, I see, in practice for people that have poor parents or not so great parents to dethrone them, especially after death. Give me a second. Let me get Dino. Dino dethrones me. So as I say, parents, do your work so your kids don't have to do it for you. You cannot do the other parent's work. Two very, very, very important things, whether you're married or divorced, okay? 
First of all, your kids are a shadow reflection of you and the crap you didn't do. Okay? Zero to 100. Either you did too much or you did too little, but you didn't do it differently. And your, pa your children and why you're annoyed with them is simply what you haven't integrated in your child. Once the parents do their work, the kids can now assume their own job. The soul came with a journey, and now that kid can focus on that rather than the ancestral trauma, the transgenerational trauma, the sins of the father, all the things we've said before. The other thing, you can only do you. If you're the mother, you cannot do the father's job. If you're the father, you cannot do the mother's work. You can only do your 50%. This goes back to the concept of self versus selfish. There's no such thing as selfless. When I understood this has changed my life, I've shared with you the myth of Odysseus. When Odysseus goes back home after the Trojan War, he tricks Penelope. Penelope had been waiting for him for 20 years. And he said to her, you cannot separate the olive branch from the marital bed. What this means, mom and dad, in that marital bed, you create the olive branch, which is your child. It took sperm. It took mom. It took dad. It took male. It took female. You are only responsible for your part. Do your part and your children will change. You cannot do the other parent's job. If they're dead, if they're a dick, if they're divorced, if they're an alcoholic, that is your child's karma with that parent. They will figure it out or not. But do your 50%. Most of us don't even do that, and that's why our family structure is so screwed. The neutralizer as the helper, okay? Um, so this is a concept I'm developing more, and I said that you're, you're sort of a seven-year, that first crisis, that first skinny cow that will then continue, will be a neutralizer or a stabilizer or a helper. So again, it could be a teacher, it could be a counselor, it could be a principal, it could be someone in the street, it could be a, a, a spiritual message. Somewhere you're getting a helper, okay? Oftentimes it's external. It looks as a criticism. Your friend's mom calls you and say, hey, you know, Francis is eating too much, or your daughter isn't doing her homework, or I found her, you know, vomiting on the side of the road that can come from an external source, but someone is tapping and knocking on your door saying, watch it, something is up with your kid. This is a midpoint to the other extreme between the zero and the hundred. Most parents ignore it. They get mad at the other parent. They ignore it. They take them to therapy. They don't do anything about it. They don't realize that it's a crack in the system that's saying, hey, this is a way to switch this around so that the kid doesn't have to go to the other extreme. Everything has a creation myth. The origin story is year one. That's why if you were born on the same year that your parents got married, like my twins, my twins energy is one. They're twins, so they're sharing it. Okay, they're going to reflect both of us in different ways, and they are very, very different. That's why oftentimes twins are very different. Because they're, they're, they're born and they're sharing the, the, the crisis. They're sharing the shadow aspect between the two of them. At seven, you have a stabilizer, neutralizer, or crisis to try and help you change and see things differently. Most parents would say between five and seven, their kid has some trauma. They start to go to school. They're laughed at. They're bullied. Um, they fell and skinned their knee whatever the story is, they peed in their pants and the other kids laughed at them, whatever. Some story that indicates to the parents, I need to change the direction of my parenting. I need to rearrange the throne and how the kingdom is being run. And unfortunately, it's short-lived and most parents don't do that. But every client remembers what happens to them from zero to seven. That's their thread. That's where they were castrated. They might not understand it until later, but that's where they were castrated. This crisis or neutralizer gives the parents, the kids are too young, insight on how to live from a higher vibration. 
change the course of action because by year 14 when the kid is 14 to 16 years old they've reached the point of opposition they've reached the full-blown i hate you get out my room i can't stand you i'm doing drugs sneaking around sleeping around whatever their crisis is is in full-blown effect between 14 and 16. It's the confrontation of what the origin story was. Now, some of you might say, my kids are great. Maybe they're perfectionists. Maybe they have eating disorders. Maybe they have so much anxiety because they think they have to be number one in everything. That's a problem. That's a zero to 100. It doesn't have to be gangs and drugs and guns. Someone who thinks they have to overachieve and win at all costs and get into the top schools, this, this obsession that we have with everyone going to Harvard, this rule holds true in your family, your divorce, your business, your children, etc. The Enneagram, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, goes through everything. And I'm going to go back to the Enneagram in a minute and show you. So if you have a business, when you started school, that was a one, and you can see the, the crisis. Funny enough, most of you will graduate at the four, right? Four years of college. That's your crisis because now you have to go into the workforce and get a job. And that's stressful for people. So you see how all cycles in our life follow the one to nine. And if you place it on the Enneagram, all of these things are going to hold true always. And it just cycles over and over and over. That's why it doesn't matter if you're married 48 years. You're just going to plot it and, um, and get a three. 48 years is a three. Um, and that's a change in the marriage because the three on the Enneagram is change. At year 15... You're going to be at a six. So between 14 and 16 is where we get the neutralizer. Around age 15, this starts to stabilize. Okay? And now the child starts a new cycle until they're 28. So specifically at 14, the child, hence why Jews do the bar mitzvah, to prepare them for adulthood does not mean that they're fully leaving or dethroning you till they're 18. But that pendulum has reached full, that kid there, this crisis that they, now maybe you put them into boarding school, maybe you put them in therapy, maybe you got them on antidepressants, something you did shifted, so now the next 14 years start, and at the seven year then, the 21, at 21 years old, and most people at 21 are established, they've got their job, they've graduated college, I'm, I'm using people like us that are in school, I'm not saying everyone in the world, but that sort of age, and, and they feel good, they're, they're starting to make money, they're independent, because it's a neutralizer. So every seven, after the one and the 14, seven, 21, those are going to be neutralizers, and I have that in another diagram I'll show you in a moment. If you want to do this, look at the moon cycle. I've taught you this before. Start at the new moon. At seven days, you're going to have a neutralizer. Something's going to tell you, yeah, you're in the right direction or not. 14 days, which is actually next Saturday, so this Saturday from the new moon is the first neutralizer. At the 14 day, which is the full moon, the moon's at its height that's, you're going to get your crisis. You're going to see if what you intended or set in motion at the new moon comes to fruition and something has to shift. You always, always have to shift at the 14 year, at the 28 year, um, or at the full moon. Then 21 days, you're going to have another sort of neutralizer. And then at 28 days, the new moon starts. So if you want to understand life, look at the moon. It's a micro, micro, microcosm of every single cycle in you, in your business, in your relationships, in your family. So we are always transforming. This life is about growth. Some of you stumble. Some of you get it. Some of you pick yourself up really quick. Some of you stay down for longer time. It does not matter. At the end of your life, something Something you will dethrone and something will stop castrating you. Something. You will get 
an ounce of wisdom, an ounce of knowledge, because we are spiritual beings and we will go through this process over and over. Now you might reach 84 and have learned one drop, one tiny little drop. I can't determine that for you. Nobody can determine that for you. That's free will. That's level of consciousness. Nobody can tell you how much you're going to grow. But I can and other people that use these theories and these, these tools can tell you when your growth opportunities come. Okay? So what I did here was I got a spiral. This is your birth or your conception, so your origin story. At seven, you have your neutralizer or your first crisis. At 14, you're going to have the biggest expression of that crisis. At 21, you're going to have a new, new neutralizer. At 28, you're going to have a new origin related to your creation myth, related to your conception story. It never changes. I, on my website, say change, own your story, own your life. Not change your story, change your life. Own it. Because then when you own it, you can live in higher vibration. You can increase consciousness around it. Okay? So yesterday my mom was over, and I'm asking her the questions. And my brother, of course, I've told you, is the golden child. She didn't want another child after me. I was an oops baby and all that. And I kept asking her questions about me for the model, and she kept going back to my brother. And I'm like, I know that he's the golden child. Redirect her back to me. Before, I would have just cried or yelled and screamed at her so a lover of consciousness of learning yes that's her golden child that is where she feels good fine i don't have to take it personally so you grow and this cycle repeats 1 7 14 21 28 35 42 etc on my next slide i have the neutralizer years the zero years and the hundred years this is not going to change for you, for your business, for your personality, for your clients, for family. This is the cycle of the universe and will not change under any circumstances and try to prove me wrong. At birth, you're given your values. Your first crisis should indicate to your parents how to reparent you, that they're doing something wrong. Most parents, newsflash, don't get that. They keep going. At 14, you challenge the values from the ones that were given to you at birth. Your parents don't like that. You're problematic. You lock yourself in your room. You put your headphones on. You're at your friend's house. You start doing drugs, all that great stuff. Your parents and you are at odds. At 21, quote, unquote, leave home, where is your neutralizer and you should reevaluate your values. Again, this is a good time to have something like this core values game. What are my parents' values that I agree with? Spirituality was one that I was very, very grateful to have. My father's love of spirituality, my father's faith, my mother's metaphysical knowledge. Saved my life. Great. But there were other values that were not values that I wanted. And you reevaluate them in crisis or neutralizer years. And then at 28, you should dethrone your parents. Most of us don't. We're young. We do it the same. We get married. We have kids at 28, and we repeat the same nonsense. That's why we get this chance over and over and over again. And don't beat yourself up. Another neutralizer is coming. Another opportunity to renegotiate with yourself, with your partner, with your family is coming. You're going to get the chance again and again. That's the whole meaning of the movie Groundhog Day. He did it over and over. Symbolic of our entire lifetime. You're going to get it. Maybe a drop. Maybe other people get, quote, unquote, more, so to speak, or sooner. It's not a competition. You're going to get this. This is transformation. A transmutation is spiral upwards, always upwards. On this slide, I have achieving the 48 to 52 throughout life, okay? The goal is to be equanimous. The goal is to be balanced. Every tradition, every philosophy, every religion speaks to this. The Tao, the Wei, the Yin Yang, the metaphysical laws, equanimity, be at peace, all of it, all of it says have a still mind. 
every single philosophy and tradition is saying the 48 to 52 in a different way. You cannot find peace in the extremes. Anything you do in extreme, even if it's financial abundance, is an extreme and is not balanced. None of us are balanced. You might be balanced in some place in your life. Those are the trines and sextiles I told you about the other day in the chart. Those don't bother you. But your your um, competitive voice is your way of knowing that there's something out of balance with you. And you can see in your behaviors, you eat too much and then you starve yourself. That was me, one of many zero to 100s. I'm so, so loud and then I crash at night. Another zero to 100. I'm not balanced in those areas and that's going to be my spiral of transmutation and transformation my entire life. So these are the ages that you are at zero and these are the ages that you're at 100 and these are your opportunity years. This is for every single person. So look and see where you are. If you understand your neutralizer years or your opportunity years or your skinny cow years, you're not going to beat yourself up. Life is going to present the opportunity and the helper for you to get to the balance. Now, you might do neutralizer until the day you die. You may never reach equanimity and a 48 to 52 in certain areas. I have no say over that. That's free will and your choice. But you are always given an opportunity. At birth, you're given your template, your origin story. At seven, you get your first neutralizer or crisis. At 14, you're at the other extreme. You're supposed to reevaluate your origin story, leave home, reevaluate your values. At 21, you get another neutralizer. At 28, you're back to the origin story. Hopefully, you're doing it with a better level of consciousness. You're doing it a little different. Most people aren't. At 35, you get another neutralizer. At 42, crisis total. You're seeing again what went wrong, what's happening, what you need to change. At 49, another neutralizer. Another person comes in, another situation. And again, this is for work. This is for love. This is for health. This is for everything in your life. Whatever you're castrated at, whatever you have to dethrone your parents at, whatever your issue is, it follows this pattern over and over and over again. I stop it at 84 because astrologically we die at 84. It's considered moksha or liberation. You can continue with the math if you're living till 120. I just stopped it at 84 because that's the system that I follow. Neutralizers are crisis. They're the skinny cows in the system. There are people that maybe are bosses that fire you or reprimand you or a partner that leaves you. They're showing you what you're doing wrong and how to fix it, how to achieve your 48 to 52. This does not mean you're ever going to achieve it. You're going to try. There's a saying in Ayurveda that there's only one illness and it's imbalance. There's only one disease. It's imbalance. All you are doing is being imbalanced in your life and you're attempting to do it different, but you're really just doing the opposite. That's why it's zero to 100. Zero to 100 is doing the same exact thing as your parents. The 48 to 52 is the way you hashtag do it different. The neutralizer years and people and situations that show up are to show you that there is a different way that you just never were exposed to from your origin story. That's why Joseph Campbell says that there's like a helper or in the fairy godmother, because these things or people or situations come in to mirror to us what we need to do. Lastly, this is not mine. This is from an Enneagram book, um, but I use my language of zero to 100. And this is something that you can use in your own life or with clients or with the family theory areas to work on. Your parents are showing you two sides of a coin. Usually mom is one side, dad is the other. So my mother supposedly was serene and my dad was angry. Okay, for instance, both of my parents had deceit. So I'm trying to balance it with ex excessive truthfulness. So you're going to see this. I was talking to my mom yesterday and I asked her about my brother. I said, what didn't you like? And she's like, well, we moved to this apartment. My brother had no fear. My brother would stick his whole head inside a Doberman Pinscher's mouth that was in the neighborhood. 
And my mother was fearful. So my father, my brother's courage was fear of my mother. And what ended up happening was my brother became a fearful adult because he heard the unmet need in my mother and said, oh, courage isn't allowed here. Let me castrate myself and become fearful. And now my brother is courageous once more. He dethroned that. So these are sort of nine Enneagram points. It's not from the traditional Enneagram and personality. It's a little bit more spiritual of a, of a book. I have the book in the classroom. I can show it to you on Tuesday. But it comes from that, that there's different points. Serenity to anger, 0 to 100. Humility to pride, 0 to 100. Truthfulness to deceit. Equanimity to envy. Non-attachment to avarice. Courage to fear. Sobriety to gluttony. Innocence to lust action to sloth and when we did the fairy tales you can see some of the fairy tales here okay so innocence to lust when we saw snow white for instance um so you can see the courage to fear maybe the mulan so you can see some of the the, the parallels with the with the fairy tale so this is a good sort of starter guide to ask yourself what unmet need did your parents have of these where did you castrate your child or where did the cast your child your parent castrate you because of your own zero to 100 based on this language and how do you achieve the 48 to 52 between courage and fear or humility and pride that one's mine that's the aladdin jafar so i'm always trying to balance that i have enough self-love and self-worth that i value myself but not get to the excess of pride where it's jafar like so you could tie it into one of the fairy tales we talked about or in the family, or um, trying to figure out your, your 48 to 52. But if you pick one, you're going to go 0 to 100, 0 to 100, 0 to 100, but you're going to have someone or some situation show up every neutralizing year to say, hey, there's another way to do that. You don't have to be innocent or lustful. You can do the midpoint. So one last thing before we go. I know we've got a few minutes left. Let me just take you back to the Enneagram. So I gave you um, the number in your family. I gave you um, the kind of keywords, you know, like crisis, origin, spiritual, or going inward, or, or hard work, or effort, or money, or power for all the numbers. What I want you to do is something that you started. Let's start a business. Let's start school. That I want you to put for homework on the number one. Then I want you to track it. At number four, you're going to have your first crisis. So like I was saying, let's say you started university at one, you graduate at four. At four, you're going to have your first crisis. Now you're graduating, you have a diploma. Oh, shit, I have a crisis. I have to go into the work field and I have to find a job. That could be one example of a crisis. Okay. Then you start a five-year a five year is a year that grows you. You stay the same. I'm still the same person. I started my origin story with metaphysics and mysticism. I've just added and added and added, but I've stayed the same. I've just added to the theories and added psychology and added all this stuff. So the five point of your business, of your story, of your cycle, whatever it is, is a year where you're just going to grow. So that's a really good year. A six year is a stabilizing year. So that in your business, for instance, is a year that maybe you don't put too much money in, you don't put too much money out, but you stay the same. You know, it's not going to be a big power money year. A seven year, and I once heard Oprah interview, I think it was the CEO of Starbucks, and I like the way she phrased it. She said, oh, so Starbucks had a spiritual crisis, and he said yes, and they had to, like, reevaluate their values. That's what a seven year is. That's what a seven child is. I have a client whose daughter is a seven. She is depressed. She is the identified patient in the family, and therefore the mother has had to reevaluate mental health, her beliefs about mental health issues, so that she can incorporate these into herself so she can help her daughter. So a seven child helps you sort of do more inward spiritual work. An eight, eight year at your business, for instance, is where you wanna put a lot of money in because then you're gonna get a lot of money out. It's a growth power money year. And then a nine year is an ending. 
Maybe you need to clean house and get rid of 20% of your staff, or maybe you have to move buildings, or maybe you have to rebrand your, your business. So you can use this cycle for absolutely anything. One is always the origin. Two is usually some relationship, some harmony, or some conflict, because remember, it's zero to 100. Three is a thought, an idea, a will to power. Four is going to be your crisis. There's going to be some sort of difficulty. So don't be surprised when your kid is four or when your business turns four that you're going to have maybe a little bit of a difficulty. Five is always growth. Six is always sort of stability. Seven, always inward, a spiritual reevaluation. Eight is a money power year. And nine is an ending. You're going to see this repeated over and over in your life, your relationships, your money, your business, your crisis. It's in tarot. It's in astrology. It's in mythology. This is the sound of the universe. This is based on the law of octaves, which is the high vibration scale of the musical scale. That's why do and do are the same, but just at a higher frequency or a higher vibration. This is the song of the universe. This is the song of our soul. This is what we're here to do. And if we understand, now I brought it to the family and your place in the family, you can understand why you have the origin story you have, why you are the type of child that you have, why you're the one that met that unmet need for your parents, and it starts to put everything in place. And so for rearranging the throne in the kingdom, you have to understand what you're here to do, and then, of course, how to reclaim your throne, dethrone your parents, and so forth. I'm going to stop sharing and use the last few minutes for any questions. Any questions about that? Is this making sense in terms of family systems? You now know the individual model. You know the the the, the relationship model, and now this is for the family systems. Can you see the parallels? They're all built on law of octaves. They're all built on metaphysical, spiritual laws, but then brought to psychology. Questions. Did any of you figure out your, your year, your number of your family? Hello? Nobody? Okay, I know you guys get shy. I'm going to stop the recording and then maybe you'll talk. Hold on.